Enterprise, what comes next? Well, I suspect that one of the most foolhardy things you can do in public life is to make any sort of forecast. Um, I was in the telecoms industry, and one interesting forecast that the telephone would succeed, there'll be at one in every city. We have IBM, who said the worldwide demand for computers will be five. Uh, and um, here, I may not have everybody with me, there's global warming, but I'll come on to uh, the, real, the real forecast that really was troubling at the time, but was completely and utterly wrong, was that technology destroys jobs. You'd be surprised just how many people in the 80s were going around telling everybody that. But in fact, it's quite the opposite. <clears throat> in those days, mid-80s, there were 22 and three quarter million people in work. Today, we're approaching 31 million. That's an increase of over a third, eight million new jobs. But of course, technology has helped. But it's even more to do with unleashing the entrepreneurial instincts of the British people that lay dormant for so many years. We, we live in a world today that's transformed out of all recognition. I gave up my job uh, in a large company and to work for myself back in 1961, 10 years <clears throat> before the uh, Bolton report, which was the last report before mine on small firms, was published. Luckily, it wasn't after because Mr. Bolton said that the small firm, then defined as under 500, would cease to exist in a few years. Small firms were dying month after month throughout the 70s until by 1979, there were fewer than three quarters of a million small firms, firms actually, in this country. And it was the abolition of the command economy, a great achievement of the Thatcher years, that unleashed that self-same entrepreneurial spirit that created the world's first industrial revolution. And so things were looking up, and then along came the internet. All the barriers that made it so difficult to set up your own business began crumbling. And now, as we've demonstrated nearly 28,000 times in the last two years through startup loans, <clears throat> all that you acquire is an idea, 5,000 pounds, and a mentor to start <clears throat> your own firm. 300 are starting week in and week out, and, and we're continuing to do that. This is really still unfinished business because my report really recommended that these loans would be the equivalent of student loans. And I hope during the next parliament we'll see that. And when that happens, a loan of 5,000 pounds repayable through the tax system would be, I believe, unleash a whole wave of new businesses coming to start up. So today, <clears throat> the number of firms in the UK have increased sevenfold to 5.2 million. But this is a statistic that I'm not sure too many people realize. 76% of firms in this country do not have an employee. That's right, three quarters of firms in this country are individuals trading for themselves by themselves. You look at eBay, you look at Amazon markets, you would be surprised how many of those businesses are individuals. And that is exactly the way that the internet has unleashed everything. 76% have no employees, another 20% have under 10. So over 19 out of 20 firms in this country in the, are micro. Of course, large firms have their place. You, you can't build an aircraft carrier in a small firm, although I've no doubt one day somebody will try. And even <clears throat> today, large firms employ about a third of the workforce. But half the workforce are in small firms. <clears throat> and as time goes by, technology is enabling 
large firms to do more with fewer people and making it easier the whole time for people to start working for themselves. But frankly, small firms aren't enough. We've got probably <clears throat> the best small firms environment in the West and possibly even the world. Back in the 80s, I introduced the Enterprise Allowance Scheme, which enabled long-term unemployed, that is those who'd been out of work for more than a year, to start working for themselves. 30 years later, two of them had reached the FTSE 100. And what we need today is many more of those small firms that have started over the past years grow to become the large firms of the future. You see, business is organic. They're born, they grow, they reach a peak, and they all decay. How many large businesses that we saw 10 or 20 years ago are no longer with us? And therefore, without a continuing supply of more and more small firms, the economy will, in time, wither away. And then we come to the banks. Now, we all know that the banks are a problem, that they're unable to help small firms. When, when I had my first account, my account was actually held in a ledger in the branch where I banked. The manager knew all about me. Actually, I think he knew much too much about me for my comfort, but he knew all about me. And I grew my first companies on the back of support for the bank. But today we have a world in which relationship managers sit in a call center in another part of the country, and there is no way a small firm can have any relationship with their bank. And even then, the banks can't even grant small loans because their costs are prohibitive. But you know, it, it, it's absolutely true. Within every problem, there is an opportunity waiting to be discovered. The banks were the problem, and it may well be that the solution is contained in the thriving fintech industry, which is all around us here in London. And I suspect that these new entrants will displace the banks, end up serving small companies and possibly even medium-sized companies. But we're not there yet. What we need, and we need above all else, is a flourishing middle stand in the UK. A solid core of middle-sized, often family-owned companies that provide continuity and stability to our economy. A fundamental difference between Germany and the United Kingdom is, in our instance, the absence of these companies. And it's got nothing to do with our character. It's got nothing to do with the nationality. But it is a function of past government policies, particularly inheritance taxes, which wiped out so many of our medium-sized companies. You know, I worked for Isaac Wilson back in the 50s, great universal stores, and I was buying for them two businesses a week, week in and week out, all by agreement. You see, if you were the owner of a private company with tax on dividends at 98% and facing confiscatory inheritance taxes, the logical thing would be to get out. And there was a queue of people waiting week after week after week to sell their business and go. Today, we have much better taxation. It's more enlightened, and as long as it stays as it is, um, because happily now uh, inheritance taxes will not affect the private company until eventual disposal, then I have no fears at all for the future. But something more than all the things I've mentioned this afternoon are needed. As much as our economy has been transformed over the past few decades, as much as technology has revolutionized the way we work, some things have not changed. The world of education. The education system that focused on producing young people to work in large organizations, in industry, in government, in the armed forces, now, today, has to produce young people ready, able, and willing to work for themselves 
or by themselves in small groups. You know, back in the 80s, I was introducing youth training scheme. And going around the company at that time, I would meet young people who left school with no qualifications whatsoever, and yet in a workplace environment, picked up all the maths, picked up everything they needed to know. We would see, um, and, and the reason was very simple, that what they needed then was the relevance for what they were doing, the point of actually of their lessons. And I realized then that the fourth R was really relevance. Too many young people would leave primary school, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, walk into secondary school and suddenly not see any point in algebra or not see any point of what they were doing. And then would look out the window, eventually major in truancy, leave school with one or no qualifications, barely literate, <coughs> barely numerate, convinced only that they were failures. And we can't afford to carry on with people like that. So for this <coughs> reason, we're giving <coughs> every head teacher in England an enterprise advisor whose responsibility it will be to introduce speakers into schools, to speak to young people, but not not with what we've been doing over past decades, not to when they're 17 or 18 and articulate, they know where they're going, but to young people in their first two years at secondary school and not great captains of industry who, who come from Mars, but people who may not have, young people who may not have left school that many years before, uh, who are perhaps they're certainly employment, perhaps setting up their own business, to come back and explain to them exactly why STEM subjects are important. You know, too many people in our society over the decades have condemned themselves when they're 11, 12 or 13 to being in the bottom quartile for the rest of their days. Unless, as particularly in today's day, we get people to realise the importance of their school days, then we're condemning them to really something which tomorrow we cannot fall to see. But that's only part of the story. What we're going to do over the next couple of years is to introduce an enterprise passport to every single person in the education system. And this passport will record all the extra numerary activities which could and should take place during the school years. I believe there are probably 800 organisations in this country that do things in school. And we're going to bring them all together under one umbrella. And the passport will record their activities. It will start off as white. The more you do, the colour will change. White, then bronze, then silver, then gold, and finally platinum. The employers will say, it's the colour of your passport that is as important as the academic grades you receive. And that will introduce, I hope, a sense of competition amongst young people and encourage them to broaden their experience. Up to now, what can an employer say about a young person who leaves school with two E grades? In a few years' time, he'll be able to see he was on an outward bound, he ran a school company, he did sport, a whole host of other things that people can do. And I believe this passport <clears throat> will be transformational for education and start to produce generations of young people much better able to cope to the fast-changing world of the decades to come. You know, there is no one secret, no magic bullet that will produce growth. But if we all work together, if we keep a competitive economy, there is literally, over time, no limit to growth. It's going to be an exciting journey. And yet, when I look at all the young companies rising not only here in Tech City, but indeed all over the country, I have nothing but confidence in the future of our economy.